which is, as I have I've failed to mention thus far, leaving Earth. Nicholas, welcome, and thank you very much for joining us. I know oh, a tight schedule, but thank you. It's a pleasure, um, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, and I look forward to the day when we can um, memorialize this conversation in person as well, but in uh, uh, whenever that may be. Um, I will be um, uh, sharing my screen. I am gonna try and keep my presentation fairly short because uh, even though I can only join for an hour, I'm mostly interested in the conversation and not listening to myself. And so um, uh, without further ado, I'll share uh, uh, my screen and, and share some thoughts about this idea of leaving Earth um, as it relates to my own work um, uh, and um, uh, around this field. And let me um, share my screen now and then take it from there. You're all do you all see a big green screen? Yes, okay. So, uh, leaving Earth is an interesting question because it produces another word where none exists, which is space, which is uh, uh, the word we have for the part of the universe that is not Earth. And that uh, word was first co coined by um, uh, John Milton in Paradise Lost in 1866 as he described not mankind going out from earth, but rather uh, the angel Lucifer going to earth or being cast down by God. Uh, and he had to describe the place that Lucifer was before Lucifer came to, to earth. And therefore it was the capital S space between worlds, which we now use to describe the non earthly part of the cosmos. From, um, uh, uh, from Milton's time to, uh, to the present, space has acquired all kinds of qualities, but we think of it uh, as a 20th century phenomenon, intellectual phenomenon, but it's not really. Um, uh, space actually dates from the earliest parts of, the, uh, of mankind's um, uh, uh, movements above the literal earth of terra firma, um, this is a slide of a, a, a balloon ascension that took place where I am now in Boston in 1834. The aviator in question, uh, Charles Ferson Durant, dropped leaflets on the crowd that said, goodbye to you people of Earth. Uh, I am moving to regions above you. Uh, and and uh, this, this idea of, of um, uh, somehow uh, ascending in every um, epistemological sense that comes from the uh, uh, divine nature of space is embedded in any sense of ascension, um, not just in the boundary, though as we have come to know it, between space and earth. Um, but fr from this uh, uh, juxtaposition, we go all the way to the, um, hold on, that uh, uh, in, the, in the 20th century, this boundary between space and earth acquired a different definition, not just lifting our feet off the ground, but um, for a whole variety of disciplines from rocketry to medicine, the division between space and earth became um, very specifically the environment that we need technology in order to enter. So for, um, uh, 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 or, or we need a certain kind of technology to enter. For a, um, a rocket scientist, for example, it's the uh, altitude at which wings no longer work um, and, and rockets are necessary. But for a doctor, for, uh, for example, space is 37,000 feet or the Armstrong line, which is where blood, um, uh, blood boils at body temperature above which you need a pressurized atmosphere to survive. So space retains a whole set of distinct definitions depending on the discipline, but it is fundamentally the threshold which technology allows us to cross. So, if we then look at an image like this one, which we know uh, very well, we can begin to look at it again because of what it becomes is very much uh, um, uh, 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 what we understand a little bit better from that history is the semiotics of the image itself. It's not just um, uh, uh, a kind of heroic, even an, uh, angelic, uh, uh, godlike figure of the astronaut, it is actually mankind transformed into uh, 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 a god or at least an angel by technology explicitly. And from, from that, we can unpack a lot of the kind of semiotic role 
that space and space occupation has in our society. Um, as uh, uh, the, 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 the most fundamental uh, uh, part of the picture being, um, as here in the uh, closing scene of uh, Tartovsky's Solaris, we go out into space, but what's mostly true of space is that there's nothing there. What is there is what we bring. In this case, it's um, uh, the, uh, the cosmonaut's own memories embodied in the alien consciousness of the planet that he's about to, uh, uh, that he's descending to. But space is empty except for ourselves, certainly culturally and socially, um, uh, if not literally. So how, uh, for, for me, as an architect, as someone concerned with the human body's occupation of space fundamentally and the design of the environment surround, surround it, my own, um, surrounding it, my own um, uh, research and, and even design work has, has focused on the very intimate space around the body itself and what, um, uh, what the body becomes in this environment um, uh, enabled, um, uh, whose occupation is enabled both symbolically and literally by a very particular picture and kind of technology. Um, I'm not the first architect to do this. Um, uh, in his introduction of the Pentagon of Power, Lewis Mumford shows this picture of Alan Shepard inside his Mercury capsule, um, unfavorably likening him in the text to a quote, powerless embryo in the embrace of industry, technology, and the dehumanizing forces of the modern world. Uh, I would tell you a slightly different story, but not too different. Uh, the pressurized tower of uh, steel, liquid oxygen, kerosene, and fire on which Grissom ascended to the, uh, Shepherd ascended to the heavens was at the time the most complicated piece of technology ever made. Um, of course, it was not designed to lift people um, or elevate them in any sense. It was actually designed to kill them um, uh, uh, carrying a thermonuclear warhead. But the invention, um, uh, what lies, I think, most importantly underneath this particular enabling technology uh, and its entry into space is that this technology also enabled almost everything we think of as modern um, in the technological sense, or as certainly as contemporary, not, not um, uh, modern in the enlightenment sense. Um, but what, what its story was, um, uh, was the invention of a particular idea embedded in modern society, which is that of the system. In the report recommending the air defense system in which the ICBM would eventually um, uh, form a crucial part, um, uh, written by Georgie Valley at the, the Defense Department, the word system appears as an air defense system. Um, and when the word system appears, as the um, uh, uh, historian Thomas Hughes had point, point, points out, a one page definition of the word system has to be given because it's a, it's a word that is, uh, that, that is used to describe things like railway systems at the time, but not used to describe anything that anyone would really encounter. The word system is crucial in the ICBM context um, uh, to give a very brief history when uh, the uh, uh, aerospace company Convair was invited to build the first ICBMs, the first rockets that would um, bring uh, nuclear warheads into space and down again to earth. Um, they failed. They failed over and over again for a whole set of reasons to do very much with the complexity of the technology they were trying to assemble for the first time, a level of complexity that was happening in technology for the first time. This particular crash that I'm showing you happened, uh, uh, I believe, because the, the speed of the, the, the resonant frequency in the gyroscope in the, in the top of the warhead was the same as the frequency of the turbo pump in the bottom of the warhead. Nobody had figured this out and they canceled each other out and it exploded. But for all kinds of other reasons, every launch um, uh, had the same kind of failure because of the complexity of the technologies involved and their tendency to cascade into each other unexpectedly. From this, not so much a new kind of ICBM um, or a new kind of object was made, but rather a picture of technology, which for the first time did not focus on objects. Um, the, so uh, after the failure of Convair, a new kind of organization was formed, the Air Research and Development Command, 
commanded by this fellow at the center, um, former architect, uh, Air Force Brigadier General Bernard Shriver, who with Simon Ramo and Dean Wooldridge, who are at the edge of the photo of what would become TRW, created um, um, the Air Research and Development Command, but actually created, more importantly, a new kind of um, uh, approach to engineering called systems engineering, in which a series of components termed for the first time in that process, black boxes were described not so much by their internal contents, but by their relationship to each other in a larger system. The inside of each component of the missile could change uh, continuously, but the uh, interfaces with all the other components of the missile um, were uh, what was most important and what were elaborately documented by the process. The result was not just a successful ICBM, um, uh, the result, not incidentally, um, uh, was the nuclear arms race, because once an object, uh, uh, instead of Convair delivering a single object as part of a contract, it developed a framework in which components could be continuously upgraded as long as their relationship to the other components in the arms race, and as we now see in consumer electronics, was inevitably um, uh, in many ways born. As an architect, though, I'm actually interested in a different story, which I think is also relevant to um, uh, the question of how and whether we might ever leave Earth. And that relates to the role of our own bodies in this exchange. Um, so, Against the sudden and seeming mastery of systems engineering, it was supposed initially that the body would succumb immediately to the same kinds of forces. So the word cyborg uh, invented as part of an Air Force contract um, uh, in 1960, um, uh, sorry, 1958, and then published here in Life magazine, was the idea that components of the body, as you see here, uh, heart, skin, eyes, lungs, could all be swapped out. Uh, just like in an ICBM to better accommodate itself, in this case, to the surface of the moon, imagined in a very Chesley Bonestiel type way as somewhere that actually has erosion, um, which it doesn't, uh, uh, but you can see the earth in the background. Um, what actually happened um, uh, was in the end quite different. Um, instead of being designed from scratch by military conglomerates, instead of going under the skin and altering um, uh, parts of the body, the actual Apollo spacesuit was designed by um, a, a, a di small division of the International Latex Corporation, best known by its consumer brand of Playtex. Um, and instead of being ordered according to serial numbers and systems techniques, it was instead hand sewn from 21 layers of earthly material to 64th of an inch tolerances by seamstresses taken from the seamstress from the uh, Playtex shop floor. This was um, actually a realm in which other kinds of knowledge were needed and came into the process through the, the bodies and work of these seamstresses and others involved in the process. Um, for this to take place, of course, other cut types, uh, uh, other more um, masculine systems engineering approached, uh, approaches had to fail and fail spectacularly. Um, the tension and temper in these failures were extreme um, I'll give you two examples. Um, uh, first of all, instead of being se uh, sequentially serialized on each modification, as was the case in the systems engineering standard, um, each part of the suit custom fit to each astronaut was instead sized small, medium, and large, like clothing. Um, however, after an incident with the first astronaut fitted, the urinary collection device was actually sized large, extra large, extra, extra large. The second example um, uh, is one that maybe gives, um, uh, should give architects pause um, uh, in particular. When it was pointed out in one of the many battles surrounding paperwork that um, ILC was obliged to supply NASA with drawings of the suit design with a delineation that fixed it uh, uh, in, in space and in material, um, uh, the company responded that none were actually used in the suit's making, only uh, patterns and the memorized uh, uh, procedures of the seamstresses. So NASA insisted um, and the drawings were produced, but only really as the result of a kind of delineated dissection of the actual suit. They're not very much like architectural drawings, which 
imagine something yet to be or imagine the future like all the renderings we see um, uh, in the end of space exploration around us today, but um, instead uh, uh, they don't um, predict a kind of simplicity or elegance, but they perceive complexity. And so maybe they share um, uh, essential qualities with them, um, uh, uh, not so much with architectural drawings, but with maybe with maps of landscapes or cities. And this is a down to earth point, um, uh, which somewhat resembles the very first point I, I made in the talk, which is that what we really discover as we leave earth, um, uh, which is that technology whose, whose mediation of our own entry into space defines its boundaries, um, uh, uh, that, that technology tends to collapse um, uh, not so much at the boundaries of space, but at the boundaries of our own bodies um, uh, uh, and their entry into space. Um, when we examine that intimate edge, um, uh, we discover not an integrated system of cybernetic control, but rather its opposite, a kind of medium or media, um, a boundary that shares many of the qualities um, uh, from its structure to its adaptive origins with the body it protects as, as with the larger systems of which it was inevitably a part. And the, the intimacy and distortion um, uh, of this boundary brings us back to the word media itself, um, which comes from the Latin middle element or lens, um, but really is just something that stands between us and the world that uh, uh, gives us new forms of insight and experience, but distorts that insight and experience at the same time. Um, the massive system of Apollo, of course, had only media as its goal, uh, in particular, this television image seen live by more than 500 million people of an American on the surface of the moon. Um, this television venture in many ways still haunts us today. Um, the 31 hour lunar broadcast dwarfed the 15 minute news bulletins to which television had previously restricted itself, um, which led their director, um, CBS's uh, Bob Wussler, shown here, to co-found CNN with Ted Turner. Um, and the ghost of this um, uh, idea of kind of spectacle of the vision of technology um, uh, 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 as, a, as a medium to elevate the human transmitted through other kinds of media, I think still lies at the core of the role that the idea of leaving earth has in our society. Um, and so from the sublime in a way to the ridiculous, um, uh, this, uh, the web that connects um, uh, 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 this, this story of technology's possibilities, but also its tendency to um, spectacle um, uh, uh, as well as substance, um, I think is very much part of the role that the idea of leaving earth plays in our culture and society today. So that's my blitz, uh, <laughs> blitz through um, uh, 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 a, a landscape of, uh, of ideas or attempt to briefly leave earth and come back to it. And if I can figure out how to stop sharing here, we'll come back to the larger conversation, which I look forward to, to joining with you. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Uh, we now have time to open up for the other participants to respond. Um, Nicholas, you also, your, your image appears to have frozen. So perhaps if you want to turn your video on and off so that we can also- Oh, okay, yeah, can do that. Okay. My um, my video doesn't seem to be working, but can you still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there. Okay, there's your vision. Um, perhaps I'll perhaps I'll go first then. Um, thank you, Nicholas, um, uh, for that. I. I um, I'm always so you're deeply fascinated by the by your your work on the on these topics and and informed by them on a, on, on many different levels and so um, thanks once again for this. Um, I suppose my my question or or come it's maybe it's a certain sort of just more of a general response but hopefully it's in the uh, in, uh, interrogatory um, mode in some ways but you know respond to it as you like. Um, it, one thing I think that will probably um, that will we'll probably rotate around quite a bit in this discussion has to do with the various different definitions of space and what constitutes space and these boundary the boundary conditions of this as well in terms of what we're 
what 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 we're talking about and and I guess one thing I I, I suppose some of the, my 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 thoughts on this are are are, are colored by by we you know recently uh, uh, the passing of Bernard Stiegler. Um, I've been rereading some of the the Technics and Time trilogy, so if if it seems colored by this by this, I I, I, I apologize in advance. Um, is the way in which you 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 offer a definition of space uh, as a kind of edge condition? Uh, I think is the terminology you used by which a, a a kind of location that is full, right? There's an argument that space is full rather than empty, but one that's defined by it's, it's a space that requires that uniquely requires some form of, of technical mediation in order for us to um, survive in that survive in that space, um, if I get that right. And I guess one of the things I'd ask, I'd like to ask you to talk a little to talk about this a little bit uh, more, um, as sort of extrapolate some of this in terms of the theory of technology that, that's at hand here. Um, I, I wonder, you know, in, in other ways, it would seem that that. Uh, the condition of uh, you know our, our ability to live and ability to occupy the earth itself is, is something that is in many ways already uh, dependent upon uh, technical systems in, in in one way or, or in one way or another and that the, the history of our species migration um, into different territories and into different circumstances and the ways in which we've produced I don't know you know uh, uh, Clothing and architecture and agriculture and antibiotics and all the rest of this is something in which the continuance of that is something that is always technically mediated, which is, I, I think, part of where you you arrived at sort of the end of this. Um, so I, I guess I, I guess one of the qu first question is: Do you see that that condition more of a gradient or an edge, or exactly how does that 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 how the condition of dependence on the technical become sort of uniquely within space? Uh, attendant to that, I think, is to is another question about uh, the, the, this very important shift that you identify in the the engineering of technology from an engineering of an object to an engineer, engineering of a system, and indeed a modular system of inter interlocking components. Um, perhaps part of what I, I guess the question I guess maybe part of what scandalized Mumford so much at that in that image of Shepard was the way in which it located the human uh, as a another component within this complex system rather than as this autonomous individuated sort of master agent over his tools uh, now now uh, he, he's positioned in a different way which I, perhaps Mumford found um, to a certain extent distasteful um, but may uh, but may point us back to this question of the condition of the technological person. So all of which is sort of a long way of asking the question of um, how much do you see that that the condition of of a form of technological and mediational uh, uh, interdependence with the world as something that is uniquely that uniquely appears as an innovation of space programs and space technology? And how much do you see it as something that is in essence uh, a, a permanent condition that is sort of revealed in the limit, in, in the extreme conditions that are composed by by and for something like a, a, a space program? So anyway, lot, lots there and I invite, you know, whatever kind of reply you think most appropriate. Uh, I, I, I will. I will endeavor to do. That was an amazing question, Benjamin, and I will. I, I can't do it full justice with my answer, but I will try. I think that the. Um, uh, I guess what what is most um, uh, so to, to go through a couple of points um, that you made from the beginning. Space is defined by a threshold. That threshold, constantly shifted up into a limit. You know, space was originally just um, uh, getting off the earth, then people thought of generally, um, uh, if you go into uh, aviation literature, people generally thought then of about 10,000 feet as like the limit beyond which you could go because that, that's when you started feeling unwell. And then um, uh, uh, this limit kind of hit a threshold um, uh, in the, or, or became defined as a threshold in the early 20th century as the boundary which you need technology in order to enter. Um, but as you, I think, very aptly pointed out, the boundary that you need technology in order to enter is, in some sense, modernity itself. Like the the uh, and and so the idea of space is uh, uh, and then uh, embedded in that too is the uh, is the underlying assumption 
behind the Anthropocene, Anthropocene itself, which is that technology has made us as gods. So we have no longer, we no longer exist on the earth. We shape the earth, whether we, whether we like it or not. Um, uh, uh, or that's one sort of definition of the, of the Anthropocene. So I guess in some sense, um, my point is that we have always in some way been in space <laughs> or, or it's, it's, it's a long time uh, since we've left the earth in that, um, uh, uh, depending on your definition of it or your definition of space sets up a very different, uh, can set up a very different set of stories about how and when we might leave earth or have already left it, which I think your, your, um, uh, your question points to. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, embedded, you know, the most interesting thing for me in terms of getting to the root of this technological history is that the one of the, if, if you think of the underlying condition, in, interconnected networks did not, were not invented in 1957. <laughs> they existed not long before. And, you know, particularly, uh, um, you know, long standing forms of human complexity like cities existed as networks of networks for thousands and thousands of years. And, and in landscapes like uh, Australia existed without cities for 40,000 years of, of, of human civilization. So the, the, I'm not trying to say the systems themselves are, um, uh, uh, are, are, are quintessential or, are, are, you know, brand new, but the idea of thinking of what we make as humans, as systems and not objects is quite new and is a, a threshold which we cross at the same time as we cross the boundary into that literal environment of space. And the conception of one was fundamental to the, to the successful uh, uh, completion of the other. And so that's the, the uh, uh, I, I, and, and then um, the, so much of what we um, uh, think of as, as part of our current condition follows from that same trigger, which is to say you can look at an arms race or you can look at constantly upgraded phones or you can look at um, the, the sort of uh, um, uh, interconnected um, nature of the internet itself as something where pieces and parts can be swapped out and the relationships are more important than the components that the um, that, that sort of threshold of, of, of leaving earth by, by then one, you know, depending if you custom fit the definition, one could actually describe that condition as leaving earth. Yep. Thank you. Gabriel, are, th are there questions from the... Um... We don't have a, what questions yet. We just had, Nicholas, we had a, a query to clarify um, from uh, Marcel Darien. So was asking if you could perhaps share the reference to find the one page definition of systems that help to create the new ICBM. Sure. That's, uh, that's not my um, insight originally. That is um, the, uh, uh, I, I write about it in the book, um, spacesuit fashioning uh, Apollo, um, and that's um, uh, but that's Th Thomas Park Hughes, who is a sort of uh, um, eminent 20th century technological historian, ran this down um, uh, in his essay. I'm forgetting the name of the essay, but it's uh, um, the book is called Systems Experts Computers, and it is a um, uh, uh, I, I can find the I'll, I'll email to you guys the actual reference, but it's also in, in referenced in my uh, spacesuit book. But he's writing about um, uh, Georgie e. Valley and the Valley Report, which didn't uh, actually set up the ICBM program. It set up the the program that predated it, the semi-autonomous ground environment or SAGE, which uh, in which um, uh, in the context of which things like real-time computer memory and networking were invented for the first time. But it's a, very, it's a great quote, the page is like, well, when we use the word system, it may be hard to imagine uh, what we're talking about, but for example, the solar system or the Grand Central Railway system are a collection of things defined by their relationship to each other, not so much by the individual parts. And that's what SAGE has to be, you know, and this was like early in, in um, uh, pre-SAGE. So it was in, uh, I think 1949 or 1950 that 
that this was being, but but the previously in military contracting, if you want to sort of geek out on it, you know, the, the idea of the object was paramount. So for example, if you're building an airplane, you'd build the Y model, which was the initial prototype, then the X model, which was the you know, final experimental prototype, then you'd build the real thing. So you had the Y29, the X29, and then the B29, and then you made as many B29s as the government ordered. But so it was a real kind of not only epistemological, but profound, but very seismic bureaucratic shift to say, oh, we're making a thing where every part is always changing. And, and setting up the, the tools for that, um, or it's not a thing itself, it's a relationship between, between things. And that's where this phrase black box becomes because suddenly the whole um, um, epistemological structure turns itself inside out because instead of the part being important, it's the parts like you could have anything as the engine as long as it supplies this much power at this much you know, wattage and doesn't produce these negative vibrations, et cetera. So the, 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 everything is defined by relationships instead of by its own content, which feels like what we all are evermore. <laughs> Thank you. We have time, Chris, if you, if, you, if you have a response that you would like to share. Well, I, I, I have a, just a question um, that was provoked uh, at the moment when Nicholas pointed to the um, director um, who was, I guess, um, guiding the uh, transmission of images. Uh, and I understand there was some manipulation of those images. They were coming in of the, of the oh, yeah. first, uh, first man on, uh, on the earth. Um, but I was very struck by your words then, uh, the experience at that moment um, uh, on the part of that director and of the team, I guess, actually shaped the structure of media because uh, they, they went on to uh, produce CNN and it sounded like you were making a link. And, and so that prompted me to, to wonder, uh, sort of a, a, a two sides of the question, how, how has media perhaps shaped or intervened in this kind of architectural uh, architecture of engineering that you're describing? Um, and then maybe vice versa, how, how, is this, uh, how is this engineering or these developments in engineering that, that you're describing, how do they, how have they shaped media? Um, because I, I know that media is tremendously important in, you know, yeah. the funding for the space program, you know, the, the, the willingness to, to do it and so on and so forth. I, I just, I just wonder, but if, you, but when you said that about CNN and I thought, well, I, I wonder if we couldn't, maybe you could add something. Oh, no, me. that's, it's a very good question. So the, the guy's name is Robert Whistler and the, uh, he was a very interesting character because the, you know, at, at, again, in 1960. Five, for example, the CBS Evening News was 15 minute long broadcast. So it was elaborately produced all day, it was beamed out for 15 minutes. For the, the very first space program launches, they had to, um, you know, suddenly they weren't, everyone was interested, but they had no idea when things would happen. And so people tuned in just to watch, not to catch a program or, you know, which is again, a very like modern thing. Like we don't, we, we, we just, occupying the space of this constant stream of media. And so all sorts of technical innovations, like um, things like the clip bank, like a bunch of pre-recorded segments that can just be dropped in, or the panel of talking heads. That's a, like, this was all invented out of whole cloth for the coverage of the space program. And then um, uh, Worcester said, oh, this would be a whole new way of thinking about news and reportage and got funding from, uh, from Turner and they founded CNN. As a result, but it was also a, a, a kind of shift in media that that uh, um, related to technology that inherently, um, in some ways, had the seeds of its own destruction or at least erosion because it was still it was quintessentially this uh, a centralized vision of media. You send this, you spend you know billions and billions of dollars, send a video camera to watch a man a quarter million miles away. <laughs> and produce a very bad TV picture, um, uh, which is, uh, I'll, I can tell you a story about that in, if we have time, that's, that's super interesting, but the, you know, and then uh, everybody watches, right? So that's the, quin like that, that is, uh, uh, again, an idea of the collective and of a kind of collective storytelling that is, that is as ancient as Homer, right? Of, of a kind of epic event in which we all, uh, in which we all share. What, what it led to though, was uh, uh, again, an inverted, um, ultimately with the, the, 
the, all the same network technologies that were invented by and around that same military industrial growth led to a decentralized version of media, net, led to the kind of Negroponte switch, you know, where uh, um, uh, the where suddenly media is decentralized. Somebody, everyone, everyone is creating both consuming and creating personal media on their own behalf, um, and are defined by their. We are defined by mediated relationships to the world. We are not simply consuming them. So um, uh, I, I think um, uh, it's a it's a it, it is you know if if you look at the history of those technologies. And the way in which they produced the phenomena, a collective phenomenon like CNN, which as recently as you know two decades ago was one collective phenomena, and now you still have collective phenomena of other networks that compete with each other, but you also have the media landscape of the network itself. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. We have we do have a question now from the audience. So perhaps we can go to that. We have a question from Marti Palohemo. All right. All right. Um, I, I would. It just seems to me that uh, we've already left Earth. Uh, the scale of the known universe is not really digestible to us, though. Um, we're no longer the center of the Earth since Copernicus, and but there's been. We kind of have a sense of philosophical indigestion because we're we can't conceive ourselves in the center anymore. We're decentered. Um, so how can we conceive of the human in the face of this incredible vastness, whether we're to step out physically or not, like metaphysically, we've already, uh, banished, uh, banished our centrality and banished our very, uh, I mean, how can it have meaning when we're so small in the face of what we now know? I mean, I, I think I, I took care um, or I tried to take care in the way that I talked about um, leaving Earth and space to, to sidestep the question of centrality, because I, I think that the, uh, um, I, I guess I was trying to make the point in some sense that we are already in space and, and already have been, and therefore the question of our geometric relationship is, you know, if we're in a field condition, if the question of centrality is not so, not so essential. Um, uh, I think that the, um, uh, but in in, um, uh, uh, in in some sense, it, it does. It, it sort of brings up the the sort of Buckminster Fullery idea of, of spaceship Earth and the idea of the Earth, the Earth itself as just one more craft in the universe. And I, I really like that idea, but I also have a couple of problems with it. Um, what I would relate your question to, you know, one, one problem with it is that Fuller had a very traditional idea of technology that was, I think, mostly guided by the seminal experience of his life, which was being the, the captain of a Navy ship before radio, where everything was contained and the captain needed to understand all the systems and how they related to each other. Um, and so that was the idea of uh, the Earth as a set of interconnected you know, systems that could be tuned and tweaked. Um, uh, is in some ways a very traditional idea that's embedded in that idea of spaceship Earth. The other idea that's embedded, I think, very latent in the idea of spaceship Earth, even the cover of the book, which shows the Earth overlaid with the geodesic pattern, is that we're somehow in a very spaceshipy way, like um, uh, a Sputnik or Soyuz living inside a sphere. Um, I, I would connect, Marty, your question about, um, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, your, your question about centrality to actually a, a, a very fundamental contemporary question, which is the idea we have as in the like the, the famous whole earth photograph of, of living in this perfect object, you know, of, of, the, of the sphere of the earth. And we don't uh, really crucially, we don't live in a sphere, we live on a sphere. And we in fact live in a very thin ocean of, of atmosphere that's, if it were water, it would be about 40 feet high. It's, it's very, uh, uh, it's, it's a very thin tissue of, of, of stuff coating a giant lifeless lump of rock. And it's the kind of smallness of that environment um, uh, relative to the scale of the earth that creates uh, and, and its nature as, a, as, as part of our own human system that creates our own ability to transform it so profoundly with um, uh, 
uh, with carbon and with other forms of emission. And so I, I think you know the the the, the probably the crucial you know, Copernicus decentered us in the universe. I think it's also crucial that we decenter ourselves to the periphery of that sphere in the kind of the image and the mental image and understand how intimate that environment is, just like the skin, like the spacesuit, and that we're living in it with each other. Yeah, like we need new epistemic technology to be able to think it, in effect. Thank you. Uh, that was a wonderful answer, <laughs> Nicholas. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and we've come to the end of our time. I can. Uh, we are going to uh, romp, um, Nicholas. If you if you're able to stay with us, wonderful. I can stay with you for a few minutes. I'm also going to put my um, my email address into the uh, into the chat if anyone's interested in following up. Because I'd much rather hang out with you guys all afternoon than uh, go to the meetings I have to do. <laughs> I have to go do next, but. Um, uh, but um, in the meantime, I'd, I'd love to follow up with anyone. Well, let me let me just again say to you uh, I, I, how much uh, we're grateful that you took this time because I know what your day looks like a little bit, and uh, it, it was really uh, kind of generous of you to to join us, and it's it's wonderful. So make it possible for us to follow up, and so thank you, thank you very much for, for your presentation and your presence. So we move then. Uh,